right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our uh, seventh or eighth lecture in our series and our special Pueblo Independence Day talk uh, for the Friends of Coronado Historic Site and for viewers out there on the web. Welcome. Uh, my name is Matthew Barber. Uh, today I will be talking uh, about religion and rebellion in 17th century New Mexico. All righty. Um, so when, when, I, when I talk about religion and rebellion in 17th century, this talk actually came out of a question uh, many visitors ask me all the time. And it, it's something that I think archaeologists and historians and docents and everybody kind of has a hard time explaining when it's asked, uh, which the, the question usually is, when we say Pueblo Revolt in 1680, why did it take them almost 100 years to revolt in New Mexico against the Spanish? And, and of course, you, you want to give that short little sound bite of an answer as to, well, that's not really the case, this is this, but, but it's really hard to kind of succinctly say anything about the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 in one sentence. Yes, they revolted in 1680, uh, but it's part of a, a broader um, context, a, a broader uh, social situation that requires a lot of time to discuss and, and, and kind of fully flesh out to really understand what's going on in late 17th century New Mexico. So this talk came out of that. It came out of the fact that, that I need to be able to give a, a lecture explanation on how you address questions such as these about the Pueblo Revolt that actually take into account all of the, the different nuances in New Mexico. Um, so to start with, for, for any sort of discussion of religion and rebellion, first of all, conflict between European and Pueblo peoples in the 17th century in New Mexico is really associated with religious intolerance. That, that the ultimate guiding principle behind the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 was religious intolerance. It had to do with how people thought of themselves and how they chose to worship. And, and the result of these conflicts led to the status quo. So the events associated with these, the, the, this religious conflict led to the status quo that exists in New Mexico today. And, and really when people ask, well, why, is, why, don't, why don't the people of Santo Domingo, if, if they have Kachinas or if they have, do the people of Santo Domingo or Kewa Pueblo have Kachinas? And if they do, why don't they show them to us? Why, why do the only time you get to see Kachinas is if you go out to Hopi or Zuni. Well, a lot of that has to do with these religious conflicts along the Rio Grande. So we, we've got a couple goals today to kind of discuss and follow through this. Um, first of all, we want to identify who, who was involved in, this, um, in these activities. Who are the players? Who are the primary players on the scene? Uh, we're going to discuss the arrival of the Europeans into the Southwest and their early interactions with, with, with Pueblo peoples. We're going to explore both the Pueblo Revolts of 1680 and 1696 and conclude by examining the results of these conflicts in developing the status quo that exists today. Okay, there we have Onyate's statue with the foot missing. Uh, there are some caveats to what I'm going to present today. Uh, first of all, uh, my work or research interest is primarily focused on the Jemez in, in Santa Fe areas. Uh, so um, I'm going to, to, to make this familiar with people, I'm going to provide a lot of examples. But most of the examples I'm going to utilize in this presentation to discuss religion and rebellion are examples from my own research or examples I've written extensively about. Um, uh, secondly, uh, I'm not going to provide any sensitive information. Uh, if, if you're looking for a deep discussion of Pueblo religion, you, you came to the wrong talk. I'm not going to give any privileged information out about Pueblo religion. Everything I discuss is going to be stuff that's been previously published as for, regarding that. And then moreover, I'm going to use some images um, to, to touch upon some talking points. And in those cases where I use images of sensitive material, I'm going to be using examples from Hopi. So examples, uh, and this primarily has to do uh, with Kachinas. The reason I'm using Hopi examples is because these are open examples. I'm not going to use any examples of, of, of spiritual beings 
uh, from the Rio Grande Pueblos. I, I'm not going to provide anything like that, but some of these are taboo images among some Pueblo cultures. Okay, with that out of the way, who are the players? Well, there, there's three of them um, in, in, in New Mexico that are, that are central for this talk. You have the uh, Pueblo Indians or, or Pueblo uh, indigenous peoples, um, not so much the, the mobile hunter and gatherer groups. And the reason I tend not to talk about these groups is not that they didn't participate in these, these, these revolts in, in, in central New Mexico, but really when we're talking about the Spanish colony of New Mexico, we're talking about the peoples who lived technically inside of the colony. And those peoples were the indigenous Pueblo peoples, and that, as well as the Franciscan missionaries and the Spanish colonists. And we're gonna talk about why Specifically, those two groups it, it are, 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 are so very different and why they're different um, kind of going on. So first, let's, let's talk about Pueblo Indians or, or Native American peoples that are referred to as Pueblo peoples. Now, as I, I mentioned in other talks, and, and, and I, I can't hammer home enough, the, the, the term Pueblo uh, person or Pueblo people is, is problematic. It represents a diverse array of ethnic groups and they all spoke very, very different languages. But amongst these groups, there are some basics as far as religious beliefs that we can, we can point out. Uh, first of all, um, there's, amongst all of the groups, there's no delineation between sacred and secular. So uh, in, in Western society, we, we really put a break, especially in modern day Western society, between, um, it, and especially in the United States, we, we really do break between sacred and secular, what is religious and what is, what, is, what is not. But then more importantly, amongst Pueblo people, spiritual matters are often diffused through a number of social organizations. And these can include moieties, clans, and societies. And not all of these organizations exist at each, each village. So uh, in, in one village, for example, um, the the, the, the the, the division of most importance might be your, your, your clans. And another Pueblo group amongst another Pueblo people's societies could be very important. Um, and, and the things that we as Westerners tend to focus on with, with, with Pueblo religion are, are Kachinas and, and Kivas, but these are just two of the most easily identifiable, but two of many different spiritual elements um, linked in Pueblo culture. And here, here we have, um, you know, the picture above is of, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to be sure what Kachina this is off the top at Hopi, and then down below the, the Kiva at Jemez uh, historic site. Uh, so what's an example? So if we want to look at Pueblo religion, what's a good example we can use? Well, in Jemez, uh, we can look at the list of societies. And I use this for a lot of different reasons. First of all, you'll see there's 21, according to uh, Florence Holly Ellis, there are 21 religious societies identified at, at Jemez Pueblo in the early, in the mid 20th century. You can see those listed here. Um, you've got the Cacique, the Arrow, Eagle, so on and so forth. I'm not going to list them all off. But one thing you'll notice is about many of the societies is that their duties or their focus tends to overlap. Also, if we were to look um, at the list of those societies right off the, the, the the top, just kind of getting a broad survey of them, we'll notice what's the most important thing uh, associated with, with, with Pueblo religion, at least at Jemez in this case, or in this example. Well, most of the societies, the, the, uh, roughly half of the societies, are associated with rain. Uh, what does that have to do? That has to do with agriculture. So they, once again, uh, looking back at some of our other talks and looking at agricultural ingenuity amongst the Jemez people, Agriculture, rain, weather, those are the most important things to, to, to Pueblo peoples. Certainly, if we were to, to, to go examine the murals at, at Kuala Pueblo, Coronado Historic Site, we would also see rain and water and weather uh, featured prominently on all of the murals. Uh, it, it's very important to, to Native Americans, especially Pueblo societies. Um, and this is not uncommon. I mean, it, most Agricultural societies, pre-industrialized agricultural societies focus upon weather and rain as the, the principal motivating factors in, in um, their, their religion. Uh, for example, if we, we were to look at, um, you, many of you know I've worked in uh, medieval Poland. Um, 
Perun, the chief deity amongst the Slavs, is a, a leather god. Uh, you know, he's associated with thunder and lightning and rain, storms. Uh, the second group is the Franciscan missionaries. This is this is a bit harder for people to grasp, or maybe not so. Um, the the Franciscan missionaries are separated from the colonists for many reasons. First of all, they rigidly adhere to Catholicism, and they're almost exclusively of European descent, which really pulls them apart from the uh, the Spanish colonists, which were of mixed descent. They're people that come from throughout the Spanish empire. These people, these missionaries are primarily of European descent, as in they are Europeans that have arrived in the colonies to practice their faith. And, and they travel widely with mission placement based on tenure and perceived merit within the order. They do not settle in any place for very long. Unlike colonists, they didn't come into New Mexico necessarily to stay in New Mexico. And perhaps the most important thing about the Franciscans for the outside world is they're in competition with other Catholic orders. They're in competition with Protestants, and they're in competition with other religious groups, including those medicine men of, of the traditional uh, Pueblo societies. And, and, and a good example of how the Franciscans kind of differ from those around them is Motolina. Uh, Motolina is, or Turbi, Torbio, a Benevente Motolina was one of the 12 apostles of Mexico and lived from about 1482 to 1568. Uh, really what makes Motolina an interesting character is he's the one who took the debate against Las Casas. So when Bartolomeu de Las Casas was, was arguing, um, was writing about the destruction of the Indies and, and the need to save Native American peoples, uh, the person who, who, who well, he defended the Native American peoples in his own way, but certainly took a very different stance than Las Casas, uh, was Motolina. Motolina argued that the Hernan Cortes was an agent of God, so he, uh, and he defends the Spanish conquest of the New World. And, and key to the Franciscan doctrine, and this is a doctrine they would take into New Mexico, and his argument against Las Casas, Las Casas believed that Native Americans were to be protected and if, if they were treated well and, and protected by the authorities in Spain and in New Spain, then they would eventually convert to Catholicism. Motolina flips that on its head. He says God will protect Native Americans, but only after their conver conversion to Catholicism. So he, he saw the world very differently. For him, an indigenous person who practiced their own religion could be treated any way the, the, the Spanish willed. And, and if they were treated harshly, perhaps that would be a means of, of convincing them that they needed to become Catholics. Um, and it's this group that Motolina, kind of this belief that Motolina pushes about um, Native Americans are not protected until they convert to Catholicism that leads, that comes in with, with the colonization of New Mexico. And lastly, we have the Spanish colonists. Now, the, the Spanish Empire uh, includes hundreds, if not thousands, of New World indigenous tribes, as well as multiple African, Asian, and European ethnicities. And I, I give an example there. So you can be, uh, you know, your Iberian ancestry, you can be Iberian, uh, that, that includes Castilian, Aragonese, uh, Portuguese, uh, Basque, those are all Iberian cultures. You can be Italian, you can be uh, uh, it, it, all these have subsets. Italian includes Sicilian, um, uh, Milanese, uh, Roman. There's many different. Uh, German, same thing. Uh, depending on what part of Germany you're from, uh, we tend to think of Austrian or High German and Low German. But there were many different cultures and groups within the German, uh, what we would call German culture. Um, and, and, and in fact, the, the colonists actually develop a clear um, a caste system. In the caste system, you know, if you have to create, the way I look at this chart, if you have to create a chart showing what people are because of all the intermixing, suggest that nobody knows what they are. They're a mix of everything. You know, the, the, these charts wouldn't exist if it was easy to determine who was who. Instead, they have to create a lab, an elaborate system to kind of classify people out. Now, ostensibly, these people are Catholic. Um, but if you can imagine these thousands of indigenous tribes, these, these African cultures, these Asian cultures, these European cultures, they all had their own different religions or even different takes on Christianity. Um, 
And, and, and so these multiple belief systems are integrated into the society. And some are hidden. You know, uh, you know we, we talk about crypto Judaism in, in, in some scholastic circles. We, 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 um, and maybe not so crypto Judaism. I mean, the, the first failed colony in New Mexico was, was done by people convicted of Judaizing. Um, but, but, but some are hidden, some are not. There's great examples of this. And one of them is the, these higas. In case, these higas were found at the palace of the governors in downtown Santa Fe, the very center of uh, Spanish control in New Mexico. And, and when we, we, we find these, these fig signs, these Azabacha higas, um, you know, you can see them here. They're a clenched fist with a thumb between it. But speaking of which, don't ever do this to somebody, depending upon uh, which Mediterranean or Latin culture you're in, um, this can be equivalent to giving somebody the figure, finger nowadays. So I want to suggest that you don't take this, take what you've learned and go to Italy and start doing this to people because it, 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 it can mean some pretty negative things. But these, these higas were widely worn by colonists all throughout the Spanish Empire and were found in some of the wealthiest and most prestigious households in, 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 in Santa Fe, in, in New Mexico. Um, they, they serve as a protection from evil, and, and, and the actual symbol is not associated with Christianity at all. It actually goes back to Roman times, Roman times, and, and is associated with a, a ritual known as Lemuria ritual, a way of casting off demons and stuff like that. But this is technically illegal. Everybody did it, but it was actually they they'd actually the the, um, the king of Spain, Charles, uh, had actually in 1525. Uh, forbid the wearing of these things. He said it's not Catholic, it's not Christian, it's not good. But we see these these regularly being worn by many colonists, uh, probably as a sign of their own um, uh, pre-Christian or Romanized, and by Romanized I mean I mean uh, Roman Empire roots in Hispania and in in, in the Italies, the three Italies. These are very important symbols for these people during this time period. So we've got the Pueblo peoples that really, that are not Catholics. They, they primarily are focused on the, the uh, at least in the case of Jemez, as we saw, associated with, 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 with focus on religion, associated with rain and weather. Uh, we have the, the, the Franciscan missionaries who are devout Catholics with a very rigid view, a tough love of Catholicism. We have the colonists who are at best nominally Catholic, but they're, they're also nominally Spanish. They are a mixture of many different peoples. And unlike the Franciscans who came to push their, their, their version of Catholicism on the indigenous peoples, the, the colonists came to stay. They wanted to set up homes and families and become wealthy. Now, obviously, first contact, um, first contact uh, is, is, is muddled. So it would be nice to say, yes, Coronado Expedition represents first contact of Europeans in the American Southwest. But if we notice, um, it's neither the first nor the last expedition into New Mexico during the 16th century. And instead, we see lots of entradas um, coming in or, or expeditions coming into uh, New Mexico, discovering the land, interacting with the people. Um, Spanish settlement came in, 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 in 1598 or Juan de Oñate. Now we have to be careful and say the colony of New Mexico was officially established by Juan de Oñate in 1598. Why do we have to say that? Because there was an earlier colony in 1590. It was an illegal colony. The Spanish, uh, uh, Spanish soldiers and officials actually came up and gathered the people who started the colony, brought them back. And uh, they'd already been convicted of crimes. Um, they were shipped off, and of course, their leader Sosa would actually die in 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 in, in the Pacific uh, at the hands of his Chinese slaves. Uh, a fitting end to a man who started a slave colony in New Mexico in 1590. Um, of course, interestingly enough, he wasn't convicted of enslaving the Native Americans. Um, that that act was actually uh, perfectly fine uh, from a Spanish perspective. The thing that got him in trouble is he was actually convicted of Judaizing, uh, practicing doing Jude Jewish rituals. And that's what got him uh, convicted in the first place. So um, just a little side note about how religion even plays a, a role in that. Um, Spanish settlement in the Oñate colony was really uh, concentrated along the Rio Grande between about Socorro and Taos. 
Um, colonizers were initially interested in mineral wealth, but the failure to find these mineral resources led to the colony becoming a, a territory of secondary importance within the Spanish Empire. And in fact, if they had found a lot of wealth, the Spanish authorities probably would have cracked down harder, not, not on Native Americans, but on the Franciscans and the settlers as well, making sure that they all got along and that the infighting, the, the conflict we we're about to see did not occur on the level it did. Um, but because it wasn't the focus of settlement in New Spain, uh, people were left to their own devices out here on the fringe. Uh, now, if we look at the Franciscan missionaries, it's important to note there were only 10 Franciscans that came when the original colony. We're not talking a lot of people. Um, there was more as time went on, obviously. Uh, also, it's important to note that the Franciscans actually chose to headquarter at, the, at uh, Santo Domingo or, or Cahua Pueblo, which kind of makes sense. If, if you look at it, um, uh, Santo Domingo or, or Cahua, it is really in the kind of the, the central area of it's actually that little diamond right in the middle. If you look, it, it's a little hard to find it. But if you look as far as the mission sites go in, in New Mexico, it's literally in the middle of them. So it's actually a great place uh, from that perspective to conduct missionization. It's also perhaps worth, worth mentioning that the Spanish colonists that came up legally in 1598 chose to settle around San Juan. The Franciscans chose for their center to be the old 1590 slave colony of Sosa. They chose the same location Sosa had chosen about 10 years earlier to be their headquarters. Uh, why exactly that is? I mean, you'd think you'd want to be getting off to a, a, a new you know, foot in life, but like Sosa, uh, they were more interested in being centrally located than they were in anything else. And, and, and really, it's, it's spread across different ethnic groups. and. Um, it's important to note that these early Spanish missions, the effort was really financed through the production of trade goods uh, shipped south on the Camino Real. So these ventures by these Franciscans, they don't have a ton of money coming in to prop them up. Really what they need to is they need to make money in the colony, which then can fuel them starting new missions and expanding their operations in New Mexico. Uh, so it, it in and of itself is kind of like a, its own plantation system. Uh, they, they need to make a profit uh, off the, the, these missions. So they're not so much different from the colonists, and they, they, they have, there's, a, there's a, a monetary value to the expansion of these mission systems. It's interesting because right away, there is some acceptance. Um, the, the polytheistic religion, uh, which means uh, the belief in many gods, or in, in the case of Pueblo peoples, perhaps the, the belief in many spirits, is perhaps more apropos. I mean, it would depend, you could ask a Native American person that perspective, but the, their, their idea of accepting very different, kind of their, their democratic or, or, or a spread out view of, of religion and religious authority allows them to accept Christ into its pantheon really easy. In fact, uh, most missions were built atop of existing religious architecture. So they, they and, and not necessarily against the orders of the tribe. And in some instances, such as this one we see here in the Salinas missions, kibas were actually incorporated into the layout of the, the missions themselves. So the mission would actually, the, the, the church system would actually include kibas inside of it as, as a way of incorporating existing ideologies. Um, it, it, and in some cases, even the, the, the kachinas, for example, at, at San Jose mission, the AMS historic site, the Kachinas appear early on appear to be linked uh, with Catholic saints. So they actually took the, the spiritual panthe pantheon of the Pueblo peoples, and they said, this one is St. James, this one is St. Stephen, and so on and so forth. They, they connected them up as a way of kind of integrating the two systems, which is actually um, quite interesting. Um, now, the Spanish come in, uh, under a system that officially is, is banned, but it's a system that actually shows up in all the documents in New Mexico. They call themselves encomenderos. They talk about encomendas in many places. An encomenda is a grant by the Spanish crown to a col colonist conferring the right to demand tribute and forced labor from the Indians inhabiting the area. They're often given as a result of military service and viewed as necessary to properly administer the large land holding provided to Mexico. So a New Mexico settler cannot work the land himself or, 
or a settler anywhere uh, in, in, in the colonies really doesn't have uh, one Spaniard given huge track of land. He can't make that land viable. He can't, he can't bring that under, um, uh, uh, under, under intensive cultivation. He needs laborers to do it in by, by um, appointing a, a set number of indigenous peoples or, or in this case, indigenous villages to support him. They, they are um, in essence, giving him the labor base to, 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 to make his, his, his holding successful. Now, ostensibly, he's supposed to, uh, to you know, protect his people. He's, he's in essence, I mean, in, in, in all, I mean, if you strip this down to its core, it's feudalism. It's absolutely feudalism by a different name. So it's the medieval system of Western Europe brought to indigenous peoples in the New World. And it has problems, to say the least. Um, but it really starts to have problems as Native American population numbers decline rapidly. So the Spanish show up and the Native American population really starts to fall down. It declines very, very rapidly. There's a lot of reasons for this. And we've talked about these in greater detail in other lectures, but of course, uh, disease, migration, and warfare, those are the big ones. And they're in that order. It's important to note that the, the, the reasons for population decline well, we tend to put warfare up the, the, the front. It really isn't. Infectious disease, the spread of infectious disease. Perhaps this is easier for people to accept now than when I originally presented this presentation. I think the first time I presented it was back in like 2014. Um, now dealing with COVID, perhaps it's much more easy for us to see how disease can impact uh, not only population, but economy and, and, and really um, mess things up. Um, more so than ever before. Migration, though, lots of people just chose to move away. So the Rio Grande got depopulated. These people left. Uh, they joined other groups. They moved on to the periphery. And then lastly, warfare, conflict, which is really where we're going in this specific talk. Initial resistance uh, was widespread but uncoordinated. Um, Pueblo peoples, we're, we're, we're talking about very different ethnic groups, were hampered by their, 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 their different cultures. Um, they had language barriers. They had traditional rivalries. These are people that before the Spanish got here, their primary enemy was each other. Uh, and, and this included uh, intertribal warfare, not just across tribes, but intertribal warfare, not just across tribes, but inside of tribes themselves. For example, the Jemez were, were probably most of the time the Jemez spent fighting each other villages of, of uh, Jemez or, or Toa speaking peoples killing each other. And, and, and that was primarily the focus of warfare in Jemez province before the coming of the Spanish. Um, so they're, they're hampered by that. They're also hampered by these people leaving, these people migrating away. And they're certainly hampered by disease sweeps running through their populations. If, if your energy spent on taking care of the sick and ill, or dealing with the dying, or dealing with the bodies of those who have already died, you don't have time, a lot of time to make war. Of course, that war has to be on a small scale. But then lastly, uh, Spanish military technology and the use of Pueblo auxiliaries proves decisive. So if, if one group met up in resistance, they, they often brought in another group to, 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 to deal with them. And of course, we have a great example of this, an example at Jemez Historic Site, which is the Jemez Revolt of 16. You know, the Jemez revolt in 1623, we have the, um, the Jemez people revolting, they burn the mission at San Jose, the actual events themselves are kind of uh, muddled through history, oral history, and, and the actual what happened becomes unclear, but certainly we can see in the Spanish documents um, a huge punitive campaign under Pedro Durán Chávez, uh, which results in the abandonment of numerous uh, Jemez Pueblos. And by 1526 or, or even 1528, the Jemez people have been consolidated uh, at San Jose and San Diego, San Diego missions, uh, respectively. Uh, we believe those represent the present day or historic villages of uh, Gisoa, which is Jemez historic site, and, and, and modern day, possibly San Diego mission. The earlier San Diego mission was at Walatoa or current day Jemez Pueblo. Um, it, it's possible, it seemed to be suggested by Benavides that the table were brought in to help Durani Chavez in his campaign during that time. 
we don't know necessarily that. Also, the Spanish claim that over 3,000 Jemez died in the revolt. So bringing up large numbers of casualties associated with this uprising in 1623. But we're certainly looking at, at over 50 years before the, the Pueblo revolt in 1680. We have a large-scale revolt. In, in fact, in terms of numbers, this is as large as, you know, in, in many ways, it doesn't include as many, many different peoples. But for more Jemez people participated in the Jemez revolt of 1623, than the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Uh, the, the reason for that is sadly, uh, there was more Jemez people in 1623 uh, than 1680. By 1680, the population at Jemez is, is, is really very small, quite small by that point. And that's true of many indigenous people. And most of these, 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 these early revolts are very poorly recorded by the Spanish. The Spanish didn't want to talk about Native American peoples. Uh, revolting. They wanted to talk about the successes. They wanted to talk about New Mexico as a land of plenty, a land where a man could go to, uh, uh, clear about this, a Spanish colonist could go to make a good life for themselves. The, the real change begins in um, 1661. If we will change the narrative at any point in New Mexico history, it really starts in 1661. And it happens when the custodian Alonso de Posada bans Kachina for worship. Uh, interestingly, Posada, who, who becomes custodian, custodian is just the title uh, for the Franciscan church. So the head Franciscan in New Mexico was known as the Custos, the custodian. Uh, now these pictures here are of some uh, Kachina masks uh, from Hopi that were planned to be sold in art markets in Europe. Uh, really an absolute tragedy, but, but examples of, of what he's banning. Now, interestingly enough, Posada had actually served at, at San Jose Mission, or Gisawa, uh, Jemez historic site, one of those missions that may have had these masks hanging above depictions of the saints. So I, I, I use these here to try to give you an idea. Um, I, I don't know if the, the, the grinning ogre on the right-hand side, what, what saint he would have necessarily represented uh, but you could almost imagine something perhaps like St. James, uh, a more um, militaristic saint being represented. Uh, th that's complete speculation on my part. But, but in 1661, these items are seized by the Spanish. They're, they're seized and they're, they're ostensibly burned. The traditional ceremonies are prohibited under the threat of corporal punishment. You could get beaten, whipped for, for participating in traditional Pueblo services. So... Posada really follows along the lines of Motolina. He puts that hard line, that line in the sand. He says, these things, I, I don't care what people are doing. The idea of integrating, you know, to using me, saying that that's a saint is blasphemy. We need to, we need to stop this right now. So like, and for a little while, there, there's perhaps less resistance than you might expect towards the cutting off of this. But that changes in the 1670s when New Mexico enters a huge drought. The rains don't come. And if we look back at that example of Jemez, right, what do most of those traditional societies, those religious societies do? They're, those peoples, they, these ceremonies and these groups were really there to make sure the rain fell, the crops grew. And in the 1670s, that didn't happen. And, and perhaps not surprisingly, um, people looked and said, hey, you know, we used to do these ceremonies uh, to pray for rain in, or, or to bring about rain. We stopped doing them and the rain stopped coming. You know, it, that's, a, that's a pretty hard thing. But more importantly, as this, this drought occurs, the, these, these Native American farmers who've had to give a lot of their surplus to both the Spanish and the, the, the churches are now dependent upon these peoples for foods to continue to live. Because they're, they're still required in, in the Spanish settlements, think of it this way, they're still required to give the same amount of, 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 of grain or the same amount, well, in this case, corn, the same amount of corn or the same amount of blankets or the same amount of whatever to the Spanish. Then they got to keep the rest. Um, in, in the case of the missions, it was even worse, the mission church. So the mission church in Haines, for example, would take in all the grain production and then redistribute it back out. So in many cases, these European people, both the colonists and, and these Franciscan missionaries are, are determining who dies, who gets to eat. And many die in resentment builds, leading to the Pueblo Revolts of 1680. 
Uh, now, it's important to note that numerous Pueblos, joined by Apache, revolt simultaneously, killing the Franciscan Pires and then lay siege to Santa Fe. The Spanish and their Pueblo allies, which some Pueblo peoples decided to, to stay loyal to the Spanish crown, were overwhelmed and forced to retreat south Death Pass. A good example of just what was going on in the Pueblo Revolt 1680 is uh, the siege at Santa Fe. Uh, the siege at Santa Fe occurred for uh, almost, you know, 10 days. Well, not 10 days, I'm sorry, eight days. Let me do my math on that one. Eight days, a little more than a week. Um, the, the Pueblo warriors, um, it, it, if we were to talk about this in broad terms, after killing the, uh, the missionaries in their individual Pueblos, they were supposed to send warriors to Santa Fe to kind of drive the Spanish out um, in, in burning, um, burning and, and destroying uh, Spanish um, homes along the way. Um, the, the, the Pueblo army or the Pueblo warriors, and I, I do like to call it an army because I, I think it clearly at this point is, is certainly an army, is equipped with European weapons. They ride horses and they understand Spanish tactics. The idea that, that gunpowder weapons are, are going to be decisive against Pueblo peoples in 1680 is just ridiculous. It's also important to note um, that, it, that it was probably pretty awestruck by the, the, the Spanish because the Spanish forces that, that, that marched out to meet this, this army were probably shouting commands in Spanish. And across the battle lines, the, the Pueblo peoples that had gathered to oppose them were shouting out their own battle line commands also in Spanish, because at that point, Spanish was a language they all understood. Uh, and the, the decisive thing, and we look at those images there, so we have a, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see about a dozen of the projectile points, the arrowheads, the arrows shot into the palace of the governors or at the palace of the governors during the fighting at the siege of Santa Fe. All those were recovered uh, where the bandstand actually stands now in, in, in downtown Santa Fe, right outside the, 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 the present day um, front of the palace of the governors, which may or may not have been the front of the palace of the, gov the palace at the time uh, this occurred, the Casas Reales, which is a whole different story. But eventually, the Pueblo peoples cut off water to the palace. Uh, the fight's a stalemate. The Spanish realize they don't have any drinking water, and that the number of, of Pueblo warriors uh, surrounding them grows each day, and the Spanish just retreat from the village. Now, interestingly enough, it's, it's important to note um, that while the Pueblo revolt is, is a rebellion in many ways, it, it, it's noted that the, the Pueblo peoples allow the Spanish to retreat south and don't attack them again. Um, the reason for this uh, may have been, well, twofold. One, um, they may have not wanted warfare. They just wanted them to leave. So this was a way of staying there. But even if they didn't want that, obviously there, there's, there's obviously a, a notion that I think perhaps enough blood or enough indigenous people, even if they wanted the Spanish dead, enough indigenous people had died already. The idea that they were going to cause a battle that would, would lead to more suffering was something that they just chose not to do. Now, of course, that's not the end of it. If that had been the end of the story, this would have been New Mexico's uh, second failed colony. You know, So you have the Sosa, the Sosa colony, which lasts for a year, and then you would have had Oñates, which would have been a footnote, um, but, but it didn't. It, they, the Spanish came back. Um, the Spanish came back actually right away. Um, Oterman, uh, the governor at the time, uh, uh, attempted the reconquest in 1680. He brought up forces and, and uh, tried to reestablish Spanish control, but ultimately failed. He, he was able to attack several Caris Pueblos and, and cause suffering. There, there's no doubt that the bloodshed continued. Uh, but it wasn't until 1692 under, under this man here that we see the reconquest actually take uh, root. Uh, and, and some people put the reconquest between 1692 and 1694. Some people put it after the, the ending with the, the, the second Pueblo revolt of 1696. Um, it's labeled the bloodless reconquest. Um, that is a terrible term, which has no basis in reality. It was a bloody reconquest. Um, but it was a slow process in which Santa Fe was reoccupied. Then the surrounding areas were brought back under Spanish control. Um, and some of the areas, it's important to note that some of the areas, they never reconquered. Um, and in fact, Hopi is one of those areas where Hopi was able to maintain its religious freedom. Uh, so a good example of the reconquest is, of course, 
uh, the battle fought on top of San Diego, San Diego or Guadalupe Mesa in the Jemez Mountains. That's the Battle of Ostialaqua. I'm sure I just butchered that word. And for, for the, the, the Jemez people watching this video, I apologize for butchering your, your language. Um, I, I'm a lonely white guy when it comes to trying to pronounce Toa words. Um, but in the battle itself, um, the Jemez resisted. Uh, the game has tried to resist the Spanish on this. And if you notice, perhaps one of the themes we can come at through this or conclusions you might take away from this is that it, in the case of the Jemez, they always resisted the Spanish. They continue to resist the Spanish and, and resist and resist and resist. Um, but unfortunately, in this case, they established fortifications on top of the Mesa top. They resisted the Spanish soldiers, which came under de Vargas. De Vargas sent his soldiers out to form a pincer maneuver. Pueblo peoples of Zia attacking the front of the mesa and uh, the Spanish kind of sneaking up the back side. Um, 84 warriors, uh, Jemez warriors, died in the battle, and the Jemez were forced to resettle with missionaries and provide warriors for future campaigns. A, a devastating uh, loss to the Jemez people in that case. But of course, that's not the end of it. So even then, two years later, we have another another revolt, a pincer maneuver. What is a pincer maneuver? Someone asked. A uh, good question. A pincer maneuver is where you have your forces, uh, think of it like a crab claw or like a hook. You, you have your forces come at it from two different angles. So the, 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 the force you're attacking is in the middle and they come and they pinch right on there. They attack from both sides at once and hopefully they break the formation of the enemy. In this case, they're attacking a fortified point. So they attack from the very south and the very north. If they time it right, you can't put people, you, you, know, you have to split your forces. It, normally in a fortification, if they're attacking at the south, you put everybody on the south wall and you kind of defend it, maybe a few lookers on the north. But if you attack from both sides at once, they can't block both. And then that's unfortunately what happens to the Haymans. In fact, in that case, in the Battle of Osteolaqua, it appears that they, they got a cannon up to the top of the mesa, which was decisive at that point, it was over. Um, the um, second Pueblo revolt uh, is, it occurs on June 4th, 1696. Uh, it's poorly coordinated amongst the, the, the 14 Pueblo, so it doesn't really get the limelight it, um, of some of the other, uh, of the Pueblo revolt 1680. And it primarily consisted of Tewa, Tewa, and Toa uh, peoples um, attacking. And by that, what we mean by Tewa is we mean the peoples the, 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 the Tewa peoples are those peoples in and around uh, present-day Española. Um, the, the Tewa is the northern Tewa, so it's the Picaries and, and Taos. And then, of course, the, the Toa or the Jemez people. And interestingly enough, aggression during the Pueblo Revolt 1696 is quite a bit different. Um, it, it's not necessarily aimed at the priests and Spanish settlers, but oftentimes aimed uh, not just at those folks, but also other Pueblos, peoples who they, they felt had collaborated with the Spanish. And, and many of the revolutionaries actually, um, we, we talked about migration. Uh, the Pueblo Revolt of 1696 is more of a, 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 in many cases, more of a mass exodus than it is a coordinated attack. Uh, it is a coordinated attack in the case of Jemez. But in many cases, these guys just flee. They flee to Hopi. They flee amongst the Navajo and Apache. Some of them even flee as far east as Kansas, it, where they build, um, uh, some of the Tewish peoples build El Cuartelero Pueblo um, it, it, on the Kansas Plains. In fact, that the picture you see below is El Cuartelero Pueblo. Some people initially thought this was the village that um, Coronado visited during his expeditions. It's not. Uh, based upon the pottery and stuff like that, and based upon uh, Spanish documents, because they actually have to go back out and get them, and they try to bring them back to New Mexico during this time period. Um, th these are Tewish Indians. Th these are, these are Tewish-speaking uh, peoples from Taos and Picaries that, that left during the revolt in 1696. They were brought back uh, several years later. Uh, but they built a, a sizable Pueblo out there, and you can still visit that Pueblo today. I'm not sure how good I see an interpretive plaque there. I'm not sure how good the interpretive plaques are, but um, bear in mind, it's, it's, it's out there. Okay, next slide. Well, I said in the case of Jemez, they really did resist and, and, and acted in violence, and they did. They totally did. Um, in, in, in fact, they, they killed the priests at two of their villages, Potoqua and Bulitsaqua. 
probably bullets aqua uh, during the summer of 1696. Interestingly enough, in this case, uh, there, there appears to be, and in fact, this is a fascinating story to show how Christianity, even, even if they're rejecting um, Catholic control, they, they, they still think there's value in the Christian religion. In fact, in the case of Patoqua, they tell the priest, um, whose name's going to escape me, they tell him, um, there, there's a lady getting ready to die in the village and, and, and she wants to give her, you know, she needs her last rites and she wants to confess and all that. And he rushes out of the church um, to go hear this woman's uh, dying breaths. And, and unfortunately, he rushes out of the church only to be surrounded in the, the, um, the, the center of the village, the plaza, uh, surrounded by the warriors who then kill him. Um, in the case of Jemez, though, they, they kill that priest. And then they don't march before they march to Santa Fe. Instead, they actually march east to Zia Pueblo and attack Zia Pueblo uh, as a result of the, the, the so the, the, the Pueblo Revolt of 1696. Jemez is marching against Zia, who ultimately repels the attack. Um, they, they viewed, um, and in fact, the, the, the picture you see on the right hand side, the upper picture is of Patoqua. In fact, you're looking in at that plaza, you, the, the ruins that are there, you can only see small bits of stone. That flat area, kind of uh, mid foreground of the picture, is that plaza in which that priest was killed. But up above, you can see Guadalupe or San Diego Mesa. Above you, that is where their earlier battle had been with the Spanish in, in, in 1694. Uh, which they had, had tried to defend their independence. Uh, instead of retreating back up there, they attack Zia and they, they, they push forward, but are re repelled. They go back up into their mountains, uh, mountain domains, the, the Jemez Mountains. And the Acalde of Bernalillo, Bernalillo leads in a punitive expedition into the Jemez, uh, uh, crushing all resistance and forcibly resettling everybody at Jemez at Walatoa. So they, they, they take everybody who's left in the Jemez Mountains, like gather them together and stick them at Wall of Pueblo. Currently today, we know it's Jemez Pueblo. Uh, this leads to new accommodations. This fighting can't continue. Uh, how do they make new accommodations? Well, well, first, and later, first and foremost, the more public, problematic Pueblo populations were relocated. They are pushed off those places where they were rebelling to different areas where they could be either suppressed or monitored. Uh, Spanish settlers and friendly Pueblos were given additional land, so new land grant showed up during this time. Uh, the picture I have here, obviously, the Valles Caldera, we see uh, emerging from this new world order, the San Diego land grant. So uh, the areas where the, the Jemez people had traditionally lived becomes a, a Spanish land grant. Um, officially, non-Christian worship is prohibited. Unofficially, Pueblos practice what they want. Just do it in private and don't show it to the, the Franciscans. And, and, and through this, we can see in the architecture, Kiva shift from primarily being circular subterranean structures to above ground square domicile. So buildings that, that really kind of um, look like any other structure in the Pueblo village. So they have Kivas, but they don't really look like Kivas. So if you're not looking for it, you come visit the village, you could honestly, you could believe to yourself, you could, you could maintain the illusion that they're not doing their traditional religion. Um, more importantly, there's an evaporation of Franciscan autonomy in the Pueblos. Uh, the, the Spanish settlers begin to take a more active role in history of the Native American peoples. In fact, if you think about it, th this is probably not how the conversation went down, but if you want a simple version of it, I'm going to give you a simple uh, theatrical version uh, as portrayed by the Spanish colonists. Look, guys, and they're talking to indigenous peoples, indigenous Pueblo people. Look. We aren't real big fans of the, this, this, this crazy ultra uh, conservative Catholicism too. Hell, some of us are Jews. You know what we do? We, we nominally say we're Catholic, we go to church, and then we do whatever the hell we want in our own homes. We wear these higas to ward off evil. We don't eat pork. We do whatever it is that our families have traditionally done. And you know what? Everybody turns a blind eye to it. You just got to pretend to be be really devoutly religious uh, and, and follow what the priests say. That is probably what happened. And, and we see that in, in the modern day study. So today, um, it, it's, it's certainly, um, the 17th century religious conflicts have long lasting repercussions. We have the, uh, what, what, what I'm showing there in those images, of course, um, uh, fiestas in, in Santa Fe, 
Um, it, and certainly portions of the Hispanic and Native American communities maintain a dislike for one another today, including specific Pueblos disliking other Pueblos. And in fact, those rivalries, some of them go back to the prehistoric period, but a lot of them are, are, are certainly um, a result of um, Spanish colonization and Spanish colonists playing the, the Pueblos against one another. And, 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 and most aspects of Rio Grande Pueblo religion remain underground and are not presented to the public. It's a very small subset that, 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 are, that, are, that are visible to the public. Um, to kind of an example of, of where we stand today is, of course, uh, Bernalillo Fiestas. So these will be held on August 10th. In fact, uh, interesting list here, they will be held virtually, like everything else in our world. Everybody's going virtual, including uh, uh, the Catholic traditions of my, my, um, my home of Bernalillo. Um, the Festival of St. Lawrence has been held annually since 1693. Why 1693? That's the year they established the town of Bernalillo. They reestablished the settlement, which they, they now call Bernalillo, or Little Bernal, uh, in 1693. It was a promise they made um, uh, to uh, St. Lawrence, uh, believing that St. Lawrence, uh, August 10th is St. Lawrence's Day, um, which is the day the Pueblo Revolt of 1680 fell upon, and, and for sparing the community, for being warned, probably not by St. Lawrence, probably by an, an indigenous person from a surrounding Pueblo, uh, perhaps at, at Quawa Pueblo, they were told about it and retreated south and, and didn't suffer um, human loss as a result of the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. But they do it in celebration. They, they, they do a dance known as La Promesa in the Montecinas dance are done in gratitude uh, for St. Lawrence sparing them. And interestingly enough, the dance uh, that they perform focuses on the conversion of the monarch, um, in this case Montezuma, to Christendom and ends with the death of the devil or the heathen. Conclusions. Um, well, for, first and foremost, if I take anything, if you don't know what that symbol is in the middle, that's the Franciscan symbol. Um, so we have the symbol of New Mexico, the um, Zia symbol uh, representing uh, indigenous peoples or, or Pueblo peoples, Franciscan symbol representing the missionaries, and of course the, the flag of Spain uh, representing the Spanish colonists. Um, some people get confused why I choose those three images for the slide. But, but what are the conclusions? The conclusions are, first of all, conflict occurred, but it was not limited to the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. In fact, the whole entire 17th century was an era of conflict, a century of conflict. And much of this conflict was centered around religion. However, it's not, you can't just say the Spanish were simply intolerant of other belief systems. They themselves had other belief systems. Really, the, the intolerance and in the, the acts of, of, of banning Pueblo religion come out of a hard line drawn by the Franciscans in 1661, which was part of an earlier tradition by Motolina, in discussing how indigenous peoples as a whole were going to be treated in the Spanish colonies. In fact, the evolving dynamic between the priests, Spanish and Pueblos helped form the New Mexico which exists today. And so now, I, obviously, I always uh, entertain comments and questions. So Mehdi, what is your question? You, you spoke um, early on about the diversity of, of the ethnic diversity of the um, settlers coming in. And I was wondering how diverse was the population of Spain at that time? And um, would the typical colonists to New Mexico um, of diverse ethnicity be uh, comfortable or welcome in Spain? Uh, was, there, was there a dichotomy between Spain and the people who were, in fact, Spanish settlers? So we, we can absolutely talk about that. Uh, so first of all, how diverse was Spain? Well, you've got to remember that by 1598, the Spanish Empire, so the empire at the, the time of Philip II, because Philip II actually died in 1598, uh, King Philip II of Spain, King of Portugal, King of all sorts of things, Kings of Sicily. He actually had the title of King of Jerusalem, too, even though he didn't rule it, um, which gets into a different thing. His empire included everything from the Philippines to large portions of Italy uh, to the Netherlands. 
Uh, he was actually king. Uh, he was not at, the, at 1598. Ireland and England were not part of the Spanish Empire, but earlier on they had been. And many Irish in 1598 lived within the Spanish Empire. Um, German peoples, the Holy Roman Empire was actually separate from Spain at this point. So most of Germany was actually separate, but it was it was um, ruled by his by other people of the Habsburg family and his. His wife at the time of his death was was uh, the ha the the princess of the Holy Roman Empire. It even included uh, places. I mean, the Spanish Empire at this time period had included places all throughout the world in Africa uh, through his Portuguese possessions. It included Mozambique. Um, it included at this point Brazil was a part of the Spanish Empire. How were these people treated? Well, we we don't. Most of the people who settled in northern New Mexico were ostensibly Castil uh, identified as Castilian, which is to say they identified as what we would call Spanish today. Um, however, that's not all of them. And in fact, many place names in New Mexico are remembered because they weren't settled by Castilians. For example, um, the Almond Ranch or the Ailman Ranch along the Camino Real is, is, is a famous uh, Paraje along the route. It's known as the, the Alleman Ranch or the Ailman Ranch because the person who, who settled there was Alemany, which is the word for German. Uh, there were many German settlers amongst the peoples of New Mexico. There were many peoples who would not have viewed themselves up until very recently as Castilian. Uh, Castile, the, the kingdom of Castile, as it existed, um, it, as, as was managed under the Council of Castile in 1598, included not only the, the Castilian provinces, but it included the Basque province of Navarre and the formerly Muslim province of Granada. So the lands of Granada uh, were, were managed under the Council of Castile. So these, these are portions of the empire. But most importantly, and the thing I cannot stress enough, is that if we were looking at the overwhelming majority of peoples in the Spanish Empire, they were not European, African, or Asian at all. They were actually indigenous peoples from other portions of the New World. There were King Philip had more indigenous subjects, peoples that spoke that may have spoken spoke, spoken some form of, of Castilian Spanish, but that were ostensibly in terms of their genetic makeup entirely Nahua. They were Mayan peoples. They were um, Incan peoples. They were a variety of Native American peoples in the New World. And these peoples, uh, through their mixing with Spanish ancestry, were the true colonizers of New Mexico. In fact, the, 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 the reason we get the term New Mexico, Nuevo Mexico, is it was supposed to be the new, uh, you know, other portions of the empire had been called uh, New Nuevo Galicia, um, but New Mexico was called New Mexico because they thought it was going to be the new Valley of Mexico. You got to remember they're all focused on the Rio Grande Valley. Now you, you'd have to squint pretty hard to get the Valley of Mexico and New Mexico uh, confused necessarily. But but it, it's all fairness to the settlers. Uh, Nahuatl tradition had been that the Aztecs came from the north. And, and many of them believe, certainly during the times of Coronado and, and, and later, uh, um, believed, uh, sung the praises that they were returning to their, 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 the Azatlan, the home of the Aztec people. In fact, this was so heavily believed that when the U.S. Army came in in 1849, uh, many Pueblo peoples recited verbatim from Spanish ideas that they were actually Aztec ancestors. Um, Confusing. Yes, they're not Aztec ancestors, and that's completely focused. But it shows how these mythologies come to pass and time goes on. Uh, so it's very important to see the Spanish settlers as, as a mixture. But it's also important to recognize that no matter what their genetic makeup was, whether the, the, the Hispanic colonists of New Mexico contained primarily indigenous blood, many of them viewed themselves as not only the legacy of the Spanish Empire, but the legacy of the Roman Empire. And we see that with these higas that they're adorning their, 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 their bodies. They view themselves as a continuation of the great Western European empires that existed since late antiquity. The, the, these are proud, 
these are the Roman emperors. These are, these are the, this is, when you look at Santa Fe, to them, you should see the same peoples that had marched across the, you know, what at the time was the globe, but in reality, the Mediterranean world. They were, they were the people. In fact, the, the Spanish kings had regularly uh, celebrated in the, the same ways Roman emperors had done that over a thousand years before. So that's a long explanation, but it's certainly an important question, actually. Okay, other questions? Uh, you made a, a comment about uh, how kachinas were uh, somehow associated with, with saint images. Um, was, that, was that brought on more by the, the, the native people or the Spanish trying to, trying to uh, learn the, their other religion or more about the other religion? We, we who's, don't. Who's the one that initiated that? We, we, we do, so I'm going to tell you because the accounts are so sporadic, we can't tell if it was indigenous people initiating that comparison or if it was the Franciscan priests. It oh. certainly wasn't the Spanish colonists. All of these, the, 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 the few accounts we have of this occurring where we know it actually did occur to some extent, um, they occur in Franciscan missions. So very likely it was either initiated by the, the, the Native American peoples themselves or by the, the Franciscan priests that were trying to convert them. Um, the success rate of the conversions associated with this time period are actually quite astounding if you believe the, the Franciscans themselves. Now, the, it should be noted, and I don't mean this to bash the Franciscans. They come out as kind of like bad guys in this lecture, and they're really not. Um, but but they're also trying to put a, put forward a really positive view of what they're doing in New Mexico. So most of the accounts we have uh, by Franciscan missionaries in New Mexico, and, and, and primarily I'm, I'm thinking in terms of Benavides's account in 1630, um, th these are these are um, propaganda. These are pieces of propaganda. They're meant to make the Franciscans look really good in what they're doing. So they're overinflating probably the number of conversions, or um, you know. Perhaps, and it, maybe I'm being a cynic here, perhaps you, you, you will accept Christ in your heart if it means you get to eat that day, not necessarily because uh, you accept Christ into your heart. Um, and that, that's very cynical, obviously, but uh, certainly for people that, that, that needed access to things, and not just access to food, um, with the Spanish coming in, access to, to metal tools to work their fields and all of these things were very important. Uh, you might attend church to gain access to these things, whether you believe it or not. Do you have uh, any kind of like uh, resources or uh, that's something very uh, of, of great interest to me. So I don't know if you, you know of any books or resources that talk about how they kind of associated Kachinas with Santos. Or There's no huge resource. If you want brief mentions of it in Spanish documents, absolutely. Email me and I'll be happy to okay. get you those two. Thank you. Um, the idea that there's an elaborate discussion of it is, mm -hmm. is not that, I mean, there might be, I mean, so many documents, and, and this is important to point out, the time period I'm talking about is, is in many ways really document sparse. Um, most of the documents, they may exist in Spain or in Mexico City, but they were burned at the Palace of the Governors. We don't have a lot of the records that were kept in New Mexico during the 17th century. Um, so in, in the, in the, this has made archaeological research all the more important. So a lot of the examples I've given are based upon archaeological data. We looked at the Siege of Santa Fe. We looked at archaeological materials like that I talked about briefly. The archival documents, uh, realistically, when, when I say Durrani Chavez uh, leads the, 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 the putting down of the revolt in 1623, it should be noted the words given were not that he put down the revolt in 1623, but that he was honored as Maestro de Campo for his services, which is the head military guy in New Mexico, for his services in that year. Uh, we, we have to actually do some investigative work to say, oh, yeah, look, that's the same time period there, there, that church is burning in Jemez. It looks like he's probably the one who went out there or organized uh, the, the putting down of that revolt. Or if I say table peoples were used in that reconquest, it doesn't really say that. Rather, Benavides says, you know, the you know, 
in, in, in 1630, he said, well, you know, the table were really helpful in, 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 in getting some things resolved. And they were great warriors. It doesn't actually say, oh, yeah, the, the cacique from San Aldefonso marched out with 300 men to go into the Jemez Mountains to, to, to stop the Jemez from fighting. Uh, in fact, the Spanish, the Spanish don't even report that there was a revolt. They report that the Jemez got angry against other Jemez and that there was a Jemez civil war that they needed uh. to stop. These are not accounts that necessarily point to the importance of these things. It's also important to mention that we are almost, I, I would say with, with, with absolute certainty, absolute certainty that revolts were very numerous and that there are conflicts between the indigenous peoples of New Mexico and the Spanish that we have absolutely no record of whatsoever because the Spanish didn't want to report on them. They were put down quickly or, or some other reason. There were many reasons why you did not want to send a letter back saying things were going badly in New Mexico, especially when the colony was, in, in, in many people's views, underperforming as it was. Um, it, it, you did not want to say those kind of things. So you, you tended to focus on the, the, the good things. How many people went to church? And I have, a, I have a quick question back to those saints. Can you comment a bit on the Pueblos that, um, that adopted saintly names, um, Santa Ana, San Juan, and then subsequently, recently, those Pueblos that have abandoned those names? Okay, so it should be noted that first and foremost, ad adopting saintly names is, is a bit of a misnomer. If somebody comes to you and says, uh, you're San Jose, you're the Pueblo of San Jose, and you're the Pueblo of Santa Clara. That doesn't mean you adopted the name. What it means is somebody assigned you a name or decided that something they saw there made them think of that particular saint or, or, or not. It should be noted that all of the, and in fact, it can be hard sometimes to, to um, identify them. Most, first of all, every Pueblo, that native Pueblo that, that received a mission was given a saintly name. And in fact, nobody referred to Jemez historic site. It should be noted that even though uh, Jemez people refer to it as Gisua, there are no Spanish documents that talk about a village of Gisua. They call the village San Jose or San Jose Pueblo. They're all named after their missions, their respective missions. So if, if St. Joseph is going to be the, uh, the saint in which the mission at Gisawa is dedicated to, the village becomes um, San, San Jose. If the, the, the mission at, um, at Kewa is going to be uh, in, uh, associated with St. Dominic, then we will get Santo Domingo, and so on and Saint, so forth. They are not, they're not, in fact, uh, Wallatoa, current day Jemez Pueblo, was known, known as San Diego Pueblo in, in Spanish talk. The, these are uh, so people reclaiming their ancestral names or 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 choosing, in some cases whether they were the ancestral names or not is it's uh, irrelevant. Um, indigenous ownership of their own lands and using indigenous names to represent their places is perfectly fine. Their peoples would have always done so, and we we have unfortunately um, in English adopted the, the the Spanish the Westernized tradition. So we we simply adopted the the Spanish names for these places almost wholesale. Um, in, in, in many cases, these names are problematic. So what, I, what I'm saying is don't necessarily, just because it's got a saint's name, they didn't choose which saint they loved the most. And then, no, unfortunately, no. Um, that that, that would be a nice story. That. I <laughs> suspected that. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Yeah. And in fact, if there's anything we can get from all this, this violence that happens in the 17th century, what I would hope you take away more than all is that a little bit of religious tolerance goes a long way. And, and, and um, the, the, the deaths, the hardships could have been, you know, they had their most successes when they were being accepting of one another. And as that kind of ground to a halt, especially under Posada, who's largely forgotten by history, but really did a horrible thing uh, by banning the worship of Kachinas, in, indigenous religion, led to a lot of hardship in New Mexico. And I would hope that in, in today's world, 
um, it, it's speaking not in New Mexico, but all across the globe, that we can all be religiously tolerant and accepting of other people and their belief systems. After the reconquest, you talked about lands being assigned uh, settlers and then also lands assigned Pueblo people, right? Yeah. Are those the first land grants? Um, I had read someplace that records for the, some of the land grants had been destroyed in 1680. Can you talk about that? No, there were earlier land grants. Um, I, to be very clear, there were very early land grants. And the, the land grants, it, in fact, if you were to take New Mexico as a whole, anybody who says, I've mapped out the land grants for New Mexico or something like that, or they show you a map of land grants in New Mexico, it's, uh, it's not good. It's not good. Anybody who tries to give you a simplified version with lines on a map is wrong. And the reason for that is the land grants overlap with one another in multiple instances, and land grants changed based on years. Um, now, I said that, that, that the Spanish colonists were literally living in a feudal society. They were. They were absolutely were. And so if you take that idea of a feudal society and you put the governor as the king, then all the local lords, the Spanish colonists, their lands were determined by whether they were in favor with the governor or whether they were not in favor of the governor. The governor changed. And they don't elect the governor. The governor gets sent in. So the, a new regime would come in. They'd have to curry favor. If you were too close to the old regime, you lost your lands. If they were, they, 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 they were rivals with the old regime and they were, they, they were in with the new guy that came in, they'd get more lands. The, the, the land grant situation really changed a lot. Um, in fact, Bernalillo is named after potentially the Bernal land grant. Uh, but Durrani Chavez's land grant, which, which preceded that, uh, extended perhaps all the way from um, uh, San Felipe Pueblo, from Tonque, uh, down to, um, to southern Albuquerque. It was a big land grant for a couple of years. Then all the people in there, the colonists and stuff like that, they were part of his land grant. He got to determine he was the, he was the lord of the land in there. Uh, that didn't last. It got broke apart real quickly. It doesn't hold up. Uh, unfortunately, the fortunes of the Spanish families here were really tied to politics. Um, and, and it could be a very hard system sometimes. Okay, okay, but the the natives who were given land grants or land, that had the same um, uh, challenges relative to who was in power and okay. Absolutely. And in fact, those land grants, so those lands given to the Pueblo peoples form the basis for the tribal lands that are, that are recognized by the U.S. government uh, for their reservations. Okay. So uh, roughly, and, and I, I do mean this very roughly, because th those lands have shrunk over time, the lands which Sandia, for example, live upon today, in the, Sandia, sorry, back, the lands of Isleta, live upon today roughly equate to the land recognized by the Spanish crown um, in, in the colonial period. So uh, that's not true of other Native American groups. For example, the, the lands of the Navajo Nation have no, uh, no uh, colonial precedent. Uh, but in the case of the, the Rio Grande Pueblos, uh, even Acoma, uh, for example, those lands, which Acoma holds, and they have changed some, and now they're expanding again uh, as, as tribes work to, to reclaim traditional lands uh, controlled by the federal government. Those lands are, are primarily the lands granted to them earlier under, under Spanish authority. Um, Matt, there's been so much uh, interest in Oñate of late. Can you tell us what happened to him when he left? Yeah, so nothing bad. You know, you, you'd you like to think, well, if he's a bad person, something bad happened to him. No, it really didn't. Uh, in fact, the, the, the key takeaway from Oñate, and it should be noted that this is um, Oñate, Juan de Oñate, he, he, he actually came from an earlier family. In fact, he, he prospered, his dad had prospered at Coronado's Misfortunes up here in New Mexico. Cristobal Oñate discovered silver, was one of the people who discovered silver in Zacatecas. His family became very, very wealthy. He was hand he was handpicked as the guy to lead the colony up here because it was thought, you know, he's a genius at his family's geniuses at mining. This is gonna be a wealthy mineral province, they're gonna make all sorts of money up here. Onyate doesn't find it, he finds the colonists are, are really needy up here. He doesn't need the headache. In fact, he goes back down to live out his his the rest of his days in, in uber wealth and luxury. 
in, in, in central Mexico, and he becomes mining inspector for all of New Spain. So he goes around and he actually tells people what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong in mining. He actually grew wise pretty quickly that he was not going to find the wealth he needed uh, to make fortune, an additional fortune up here in New Mexico, and he left. Um, the Oñate family, interestingly enough, is not necessarily tied to the fortunes of New Mexico. Um, it, it, if you were to look at a positive Spanish figure, and I, in in a, in a sense, um, uh, from a from a, a colonial point of view, this is a horrible thing. Well, yeah, like, uh, not not the most tolerant, but certainly a man who believed in New Mexico. You're you're probably better focused on De Vargas uh, as a a person who really wanted to see New Mexico succeed. Now, in all fairness, De Vargas really wanted to be governor of Guatemala. He really didn't want to necessarily be governor of New Mexico, but he died in service to the crown in New Mexico. It's not like he went off to, to lead. He, and in fact, he died. Well, he, he died of uh, dis, probably dysentery, but he died on campaign against Native American or indigenous peoples. He literally, for whatever reason, the, 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 the cliques for him were absolute war, no, you know, he's going to bring this colony back. And he fought for what he believed in. Yes. Wasn't Oñate replaced by Peralta? Yes. When Oñate was in disgrace of sorts? Of well, sorts. he's in disgrace, but he's still super uber wealthy. I mean, he goes <laughs> down and, and so, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. In the New Mexico narrative, he was a bad manager and he was kicked out. Oh no, he had to go back to his nice hacienda, his huge hacienda in Zacatecas. And oh, you know, in, instead of living in, 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 in some poor, uh, you know, village where they were trying to barely meek out a, uh, you know, a, a, a going of it. He had hundreds of servants attending to his every needs. Oh no, poor Oñate in that case. And I mean that humorously, obviously, of course, but certainly as far as figures go, Oñate turned out just fine. Now it was under Peralta that the, 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 the Spanish capital, the colonial capital was going to move to Santa Fe in the first place. Uh, Peralta did a lot to, to shape the early colonial framework of New Mexico. Um, certainly a, a lot of Spanish governors uh, worked in, in many different ways. But yes, the idea that he left in disgrace, yes, it's perfect. Just like it's easy to say, well, Oñate founded the colony or Coronado was the first explorer in New Mexico. These are oversimplifications of, of, of bigger issues. And history is never that simple. It's very complex and, and very challenging. And even still here, while I tried to present examples and, and give you a much more complicated narrative than perhaps the one you're, you're accustomed to, I, I would hope you'd, you'd understand that even still then, I'm simplifying things a great deal. I have to. I mean, you could, the, the, it, took, it took 100 years for these events pretty much to play out, if you, if you want to look at it that way. There's no way I can summarize in, in an hour-long presentation what occurred over the course of 100 years. So I'll answer one more question, and I'll try yeah, to be brief. Of Oñate, uh, uh, you call it the Oñate uh, colony, and I, I like that. Uh, but like the, the Albuquerque Museum, their plaques have it as the Oñate uh, expedition. Is there a, what, so, why is one called expedition? Why is, so my, my use of the word colony has to do with the way I'm – uh, as we grow as archaeologists and historians, we, we recalibrate our thoughts on things. Uh, one of the things that makes more sense to me today, and perhaps I see as the next narrative for New Mexico history, is to look at um, the Spanish colony in New Mexico is actually three distinct colonies. Um, now, have I written about this, or do I know of anybody who's really written about this in great deal? In fact, Homer Milford, uh, who's passed away now, I'll give him credit. He, he talked about this at great length before anybody else did. And the reality is because he loved the Cerritos Hills. Um, so one of the better ways, perhaps, that I would argue to think about New Mexico is to look at his three distinct colonies. You have the Sosa colony of 1590-1591. That is the slave colony. That's the colony that's focused on mining in the Cerritos. You have Oñate's colony, which is, I would, I would guesstimate the, the the encomenda colony. It's the colony in which you're going to you're going to see large impressment of Native American peoples. You're going to see the establishment of huge missions as corporate ventures to 
to, to capitalize on the indigenous labor. And then you have de Vargas's colony, which is the colony of, of, of subsistence farmers and, and, and the colony that survives to this day. And, and the reason I would argue those are three separate colonies is if you look at what they're doing in those three colonies, it's very different from one another. Um, the, the, the colony of Sosa is, is slavers and it's, it's industrial production. It's, it's let's make as much silver as we possibly can. Let's sell the indigenous labor. The, the, the second colony is associated with big farms, and big haciendas. Uh, the, the, the Vargas colony, the third colony, I believe is very different. Uh, De Vargas is calling us, the people who return to New Mexico and the new people that come into the 18th century are associated with just having a living up here. They, they still want to be Spanish nobility. Obviously, they want a good life for themselves. But th their farming holdings are much smaller. Their use of indigenous labor is much more minuscule. Their, their, their settlements are dispersed. Um, their, 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 their colony is not governed by uh, militaristic prowess. Um, and, and, and in fact, in many ways, they're a defensive colony. They're, 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 instead of looking to expand the colonial framework, they're looking at uh, making sure their, their, their holdings are defended against raids from Athabascan peoples and things like that. So I think you could actually say, um, you, you could actually make a case that New Mexico is actually three Spanish colonies. The, the place we call New Mexico was actually three different Spanish colonies. And so for me, the Sosa colony, the Oñate colony, and the De Vargas colony kind of represent that, that division. Oñate as an expedition could also, you could even further break it down. You could say Oñate's colony was really um, um, San Juan Pueblo. It was at San Juan or San Juan de los Caballeros. You know, you could you could split it up any way you want. But I think those three major divisions are really good. And with that, I have definitely gone over my time today. Thank you very much. You were a wonderful audience today. And Thank you, man. I look forward to Thank seeing you guys you, all in two weeks. Bye.